Welcome back to our fifth episode this year and episode 44. In our previous four episodes this year, the first two were on Beethoven as sort of a transformative figure from the classical era to the romantic era. In the next two episodes, episodes 42 and 43, we talked about the Romantic era and some of the characteristics of the Romantic era. We talked about characteristics of the era in general, and then we talked about some musical characteristics as well. And that's leading us here today to start talking about some of the main figures and most important genres when it comes to romantic music. So that's where we're starting in on today. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. This might this section here on the early romantics might be four episodes or it might be three. I can't remember off the top of my head. But we're going to have lots of listening examples. Um, and there's some really cool, interesting music that's going to come up along the way. So... Welcome to this fascinating journey into the world of the early Romantic period in music. Today we're embarking on an exploration of the revolutionary changes that occurred in the musical scene during the 19th century. During the early Romantic period, composers broke away from the established rules of the classical era, resulting in a remarkable shift in musical expression. They infused their compositions with intense emotions, embraced individualism, and sought to delve into the depths of human experiences. Their groundbreaking work forever transformed the art of sound. Just as with the Industrial Revolution, the early Romantic composers aimed to reflect the same transformative spirit in their music. They envisioned a world where imagination soared, where poetry, nature, and human emotions intertwine seamlessly. Through symphonies, concertos, and operas, they aim to evoke powerful passions and directly connect with the human soul. The early Romantic period gave rise to extraordinary composers, each leaving a legacy in the history of music. Ludwig van Beethoven, a pioneer who bridged that gap between classical and romantic periods, unleashed his fiery spirit through innovative compositions that challenged traditional musical norms. During this period, composers also explored the immense possibilities of orchestration. They employed larger ensembles and harnessed the potential of new and improved musical instruments. The symphony orchestra itself became an instrument capable of conveying a wide range of emotions, from heart-wrenching sadness to joyous triumph. So together, let's celebrate the courage, sensitivity, and extraordinary beauty of the early Romantic period in music. Let's unravel the mysteries of their compositions, embrace the evocative landscapes they created, and allow ourselves to be captivated by the unparalleled expressions of the human spirit. So, thank you, and may the symphonies of the early romantics fill our hearts and souls. The early Romantics comprised an incredibly brilliant generation of composers, perhaps the most remarkable in the entire history of music. Born between 1797 and 1813, this period saw the emergence of Franz Schubert, Robert Schumann, Frederick Chopin, Felix Mendelssohn, Franz Liszt, Hector Berlioz, Richard Wagner, and Giuseppe Verdi. Although their brilliance was undeniable, their lives were relatively short, and only the last four composers mentioned continued their significant contributions into the second half of the century. Two important points stand out when considering this group of early Romantic composers. Firstly, the music of Ludwig van Beethoven had a profound impact on them. Although this influence was naturally stronger among German composers, compared to non-Germans. Schubert, who resided in Vienna under Beethoven's influence, 
was directly influenced by the older master, whereas Chopin, a Pole living in Paris, felt Beethoven's impact in a more indirect way. The second noteworthy aspect is that these composers drew deep inspiration from literary romanticism, which had thrived even before they were born. Schubert, for example, composed numerous songs based on texts by romantic poets like Goethe, Novalis, and Friedrich Schlegel. Schumann's admiration for the German romantic novelist Jean-Paul Richter was also evident both in his music and his own writings. It's worth mentioning that the Romantics held Shakespeare in very high esteem, and almost all the composers mentioned here wrote music associated with his plays. The ordinary German word for song is Lied. If you wanted to pluralize it, um, it's pronounced Lieder, as in sort of like leader, but a bit softer on the D. However, the term lead also holds a special meaning in the context of music. It refers to a specific type of German song that emerged in the late 18th century and thrived during the 19th century. As a result, the lead became one of the most significant miniature genres of the Romantic era. While it is difficult to make generalizations about the melodies of these songs, some are simple tunes while others are melodically intricate, they do share certain characteristic features. That first feature is accompaniment. A lead is almost always accompanied by the piano alone and the piano's contribution holds significant artistic value. In fact, the pianist becomes more than a mere accompanist. They become a discreet partner to the singer, enhancing the overall effect. The second thing is poetry. The text of a lead typically consists of a romantic poem of considerable merit, at least according to the composer's judgment. Therefore, when experiencing a lead, it is important not only to grasp the meaning of the words, but also appreciate how the poetic imagery and emotions intertwine. The art of the lead depends on the composer's sensitivity to the poetic content. Now the third aspect is mood. Another characteristic somewhat difficult to articulate is the sense of intimacy conveyed by these pieces. The singer and the pianist seem to share an emotional insight with you alone, rather than addressing a whole audience. The words and music are uttered softly, inwardly. Leader are intended for the intimacy of a living room, not a formal concert hall, and that is where they're best enjoyed. The lead is a distinct genre of German song that emerged during the late 18th century and 19th centuries. They're usually accompanied by piano, feature romantic poetry as their lyrics, and aim to create an intimate and emotional resonant atmosphere. The lead is best experienced in a cozy setting rather than a grand concert hall. So, we are going to experience our first lead here together. Now, Franz Schubert is widely regarded as the earliest and, for many musicians, the greatest master of the lead. Despite his short life, he left behind a staggering legacy of nearly 700 songs. In the year 1815, when Schubert was just 18 years old, he achieved an astonishing feat of composing more than one song every two days. While some of these songs are brief, accompanied by simple piano melodies, Schubert's compositions are renowned for their unique and captivating melodic sense. His melodies flow with spont spontaneity and charm, showcasing his exceptional talent. As Schubert matured as a composer, his melodies grew even richer without losing their inherent beauty. 
when combined with careful selected po poems, his songs reveal a remarkable depth of psychological insight, delving into the inner workings of the human experience. One of Schubert's songs from 1850, the Erlkinich, or Earl King, instantly became a sensation and remains his most well-known lead to this day. It was published as his Opus One, marking a significant milestone in his career. While Schubert composed numerous lengthy narrative songs during this period, the Earl King stands out for its gripping and intense dramatic quality, capturing the listener's attention and imagination. So this picture here is supposed to sort of depict Schubert playing an evening with the people he hung out with that we refer to as the Schubertians. To the left is Johann Vogel, an older singer, one of uh, Schubert's main supporters. Their friend Moritz von Schwind started this picture, but as you can tell, didn't quite finish it. So the poem featured in Schubert's The Earl King is written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who was considered the greatest literary figure of his time. Goethe was a versatile writer, encompassing various genres such as romantic and classical poetry, novels, plays, naturalism, and philosophy. He became a favored source of text for many generations of lead composers, including Schubert. Goethe's poem crafted in the form of an old storytelling ballad that was popular during the Romantic era, explores themes of death and the supernatural. It has gained fame in its own right due to its compelling content. Interestingly, although Goethe's poem consists of eight parallel stanzas, each stanza in Schubert's composition is set to different or modified music. This approach is known as through-composed, as opposed to strophic, where the same music is repeated for each stanza. The poem itself invites this kind of musical treatment, as its mood undergoes dramatic changes throughout. It tells the story of a father riding his horse through the night in a state of fury, accompanied by his child, who is presumably suffering from a severe fever. The child claims to see and hear a murderous demon known as the Earl Kinnich. This Earl King initially lures the child, then tries to persuade him, and eventually resorts to threats and attacks. The father, unable to comprehend the situation and growing impatient, attempts to calm the boy. However, by the time they reach home, it becomes tragically apparent that the boy has died. The haunting narrative and shifting emotions of Goethe's poem, combined with Schubert, Schubert's evocative musical composition, makes the Earl King a captivating and powerful work of art. It really is a remarkable piece of music. You'll hear the soloist putting different effects on his voice to try to portray the different characters in the poem. At times, he's got this dun-dun type voice where he's evoking the father. At other times, this very sort of sweet and lyrical voice, which is that of the Earl King trying to lure the boy away. And then other times, this hectic worried, quick lines of the sun. The Earl King begins with a piano introduction that establishes a mood of dark, intense excitement. The right hand of the piano plays harsh, repeated notes and triplets, mimicking the sounds of a horse's hoof, while the left hand contributes an agitated motive. Schubert ingeniously created distinct musical motives for each of the poem's characters, including the father, the boy, the Earl King, and the narrator. 
each voice embodies the speaker's personality in contrast to the others. The father's part is portrayed with low, rigid, and gruff tones, while the boy's voice is high-pitched and frantic. The Earl King's melodies sung softly, marked PPPP, and inaudible to the father, have an ominously sweet quality as he entices the boy with promises of lovely games. There are two musical elements that contribute to the coherence of this lengthy song. First, the piano's triplet rhythm persists incessantly throughout the composition, only ceasing in the very last end, where a recitative style indicates the end of the ride. Interestingly, the triplets are somewhat muted during the Earl King's speeches, which may suggest that the child hears him in a feverish daze. Second, there is a significant musical repetition that help unify the piece. The agitated writing motive is heard in stanzas one and two, as well as in the final stanza, stanza eight. While a desperate and strained phrase sung by the boy gradually ascends higher and higher as he pleads with his father appearing in stanzas four, six, and seven. These musical techniques and repetitions contribute to the overall structure and the thematic coherence of the Earl King, enhancing its dramatic impact and emotional intensity. So, with that, let's check out Schubert's Erlknich. <laughs> Ah! 
very interesting song. I remember the first time I heard that piece of music and I was incredibly moved by it. Um, very, very powerful. So before we end off things today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Schubert, the gentleman that wrote, just wrote the song that we listened to. So Schubert was the son of a lower middle class Viennese schoolmaster. There was always music in his home, and the boy received a solid musical education in the training school for Viennese court singers. His talent amazed his teachers and also a number of schoolma schoolmates who remained devoted to him throughout his career. Schubert began by following his father's footsteps as a school teacher, but without much enthusiasm, which caused him to soon give up teaching to devote all his time to music. He was an endearing but shy and unspectacular individual who led an unspectacular life. However, it was the sort of life that would have been impossible before the Romantic era. Schubert never married, it is believed that he was gay, and never held a regular job. He was sustained by odd fees for teaching and publications and by contributions from a circle of friends who called themselves the Schubertians. They were all young musicians, artists, writers, and music lovers. One of the Schubertians, Moritz von Schwind, who became an important painter, has left us many charming pictures of the group at parties, on trips to the country, and so on. We saw one of, saw one of those earlier. It was an atmosphere especially conductive to an intimate musical genre such as the lead. Schubert wrote nearly 700 liter and many choral songs. For a time, he roomed with a poet, Johann Meinhofer, who provided him with gloomy texts for about 50 of them. But it's unfortunate that Schubert's wonderful songs have tended to overshadow his symphonies, sonatas, and chamber music. Starting out with classical genres, Schubert, in his very short lifetime, transformed them under the influence of Romanticism. He never introduced himself to Beethoven, even though they lived in the same city. Perhaps he instinctively felt he needed to keep his distance from the overpowering older master. It speaks much for Schubert that he was able to write such original and powerful works as the Unfinished Symphony, the so called Great Symphony in C, and others right underneath Beethoven's shadow. We actually listened to a little bit of that unfinished symphony back, I think it was in our second year together. A few of Schubert's instrumental works include melodies taken from his own song, the popular Trout Quintet, the String Quartet in D minor, also known as Death and the Maiden, and the Wanderer Fantasy for Piano. Schubert died in a typhoid fever epidemic when he was only 31. He never had a performance of his late symphonies, and much of his music came to light only after his death. The picture that you see here on the screen shows Schubert around the time that he wrote The Earl King. And so with that little blurb on Schubert, that is where we're going to leave things off for this week. Next week, we're going to come and look at the song cycle and look at one by Schumann. Um, and that's going to be our main focus. There's going to be lots of listening next week. So until next week, cheers. Cheers.